Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are connecting from. And welcome, everybody, to the webinar, The State of Land Data, Transforming Africa into a Powerhouse of the Future. Before I introduce myself, let me um, inform everyone that there is an interpretation in uh, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. So please um, click on the globe icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen and select your language. Thank you, everyone. My name is Laura Meggiolaro. I'm team um, the, uh, managing director, sorry, at the Land Porter Foundation. And welcome to this webinar, which is co-hosted by the Land Portal Foundation, GIZ, and the Network for Land Governance in Africa, NALGA. So in collaboration with our colleagues uh, from the NALGA, the RCR, uh, and RMD, the, the government of Liberia, the Land Portal has convened this panel to discuss legal, technical, and capacity challenges that may affect access to and proper use of land data and land information and its um, impact for Africa. So the webinar will also showcase the state of land information research program by the Land Porter Foundation and the importance of measuring information for the public good, as well as the work done by our colleagues uh, from NALGA, RCR, uh, RCRMD, um, GZ Senegal, uh, to work and build capacity in land governance in Africa. So a few logistical notes before we start. Feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself and the country where you are connecting from. Uh, this webinar is uh, live stream and in several platforms and also recorded. So you will also receive the recording later. Um, Feel free to introduce yourself and also, um, also ask questions. But for the questions, please use the Q&A box uh, to put any questions to um, our panelists. And we will try to address as many questions as possible um, at, the, at the end of the discussion. Let me now introduce um, our um, panelists, the panelists today. So we have... Um, Dr. Mahoub Solomon um, from the Liberian Land Authority. Um, Mahoub Solomon is the assistant director of the serving and mapping within the Liberian Land Authority. We also have, welcome Mahoub. We have also Ken Casera from the uh, Regional Center for Mapping and Resources for Development, RCMRD. Casera is the user engagement lead within the center and has a background in geoinformation science and urban planning and management. Welcome, Ken. We have Nanny Wisher. And Nanny is the uh, lead of the GZ project SLGA, Strengthening Advisory Capacity for Land Governance in Africa, financed by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Thank, uh, thank you for joining, um, Nanny, and welcome. And we have Seydina um, Mohamed Mbaye, Technical Advisor in the GIZ program, Improving Land Management in Senegal. Thank you for joining, Seydina. And last but not least, we have Charlton Mbaye from the Land Porter Foundation. Charlton is the Land Information um, Specialist at the land portal and it leads the work on the state of land information. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining. So um, we will start by um, introducing um, access to information across Africa with few examples from Liberia and Senegal. We discuss about the challenges and lessons learned over the recent Years. We also introduce um, our um, SOLI index, uh, with the, uh, has the aim of benchmarking access to um, land data, and also look at the, at the future and what the future holds for all of us. And we also welcome, of course, uh, the questions from you. So we, 
access to information is a is a rights. So is a rights in itself, but it's also an enabling rights. So it's a right that is necessary for the realization of other human rights. Article 9 of the African Charter on Human and People Rights guarantees the right to every individual to receive information, but to further assist state parties to implement the rights outlined in the Charter, the, the African Commission on Human and People Rights has adopted soft law measures to further define these rights. So the, um, the African Commission has developed in particular the Africa model law on access to information. And this model law offer very detailed and practical guidance on legislative obligations concerning the right to access information under the African Charter. And of course, every state implements um, uh, has then the obligation to implement uh, this soft law at the national level. Additionally, the African Union Agenda 2063, which is the Africa strategic framework for inclusive sustainable development, has identified a number of very high level goals, including democratic governance, institutional reform, transparency, and participation. And some of these goals, in particular goal 11, 12, 13, align very well with the Sustainable Development Goal 16, which again emphasizes access to information. I wanted to mention that to show that there are very high level actions and commitments at, at the continental level, on um, access to information that frame access to information as an important driver for Africa development. And there is a really, um, and it shows really a continental um, high level commitment and leadership in this, in this area. So um, let me now go to our panelists and I will start with you, Tommy. And I wanted to ask, um, the land Porter has conducted, has been conducting research on uh, measuring, documenting the state of land data across 17 countries in Africa. So while the land Porter continues this, this research um, and this work um, in Africa, but also elsewhere now with the aim of scaling and developing uh, also a state of land information index now that describe the global state of land data by 2025. What is the overall picture that can be derived from your research, um, for the research that you've been conducting so far? How many countries are implementing the ambitious legal framework on access to information I was referring to? Over to you, Tommy. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Laura. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's difficult to say overall, but I will just try and, and summarize, you know, what has been happening at the continental level. If we take into account that in, in 2000, only one country in Africa had an access to information law, and that was South Africa. The picture has since changed a lot. In 2013, um, the ATI law was adopted, and by 2023, we now see that 27 countries out of 54 in Africa have adopted an ATI law, and we also see that legislation is pending in another eight countries. So we're talking about 35 countries, more than half the countries in Africa now having adopted a consistent legal framework for making access to information not only a right, but providing the kind of necessary framework for implementing um, these kind of rights. And I think that's, that's significant, very significant progress. A lot more needs to be done, but I think on the positive side, this is an indicator of the importance of having this kind of continental guidance. We also see that another 36 countries have also adopted data protection laws uh, during this time frame as well. And of course, this is equally important. And I want to stress that, you know, when we talk about access to information, 
we are not talking about free and unfettered access. We are talking about consideration for privacy and for ethical reasons that there's information that may not be made public and governments do need to consider that as well. And while no single instrument can be credited for this kind of progress, I think the model law uh, is one initiative that has contributed to that. But we also see in some countries that have implemented an ATI law, there tends to be better performance uh, in terms of openness and access to data, although this is not completely uniform. But there are also countries that in the absence of an ATI law um, have already put in place other laws, other policies like a spatial data infrastructure policy and other mechanisms that can also uh, contribute to opening up the space for making information available. So while that enabling framework is important, it sends a high level political um, message. Um, it, we see that as it creates that momentum, the discussions happen and competencies start getting developed. In the countries that we looked at most recently, eight out of 11 countries have an ATI law where we've conducted the SOLI, and the three that don't have it, two more have ATI laws pending. So we definitely see there where open data and access to information is a discussion, and ATI law I is an ATI law is on the books or it is in development. And the last thing that I want to say is that we also see other African institutions like the Development Bank, for example, implementing open access policies. And what is interesting in the Development Bank when they introduce their open access policy, five out of the seven reasons that they listed for introducing an open access data policy, five of those reasons relate to internal performance of their mandate. And I think it's important to emphasize that because it puts the opening up of information in the context of improved service delivery by those organizations that are opening up information. That's very interesting, Tommy. Very interesting to hear that not only increased access to information is, is an engine for um, increased you know, uh, civic action, you know, uh, but also public services and overall economic development. Thank you for, um, for this contribution, um, Tommy. I wanted now to hear from a regional perspective. Um, first to Dr. Mahound, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Mahoun Solomon, I wanted to ask you how, uh, how this uh, African Union legal framework has inspired Liberia to consider um, opening up access to um, information. Um, has been okay. one of the first adopters, no? Liberia has been one of the first uh, adopters of this access to information legislation. Um, yeah, I wanted to hear your experience of how access to information look like in, in Liberia, what has been achieved, uh, how much progress have you done? Um, yeah, over to you, um, Dr. Mahoum. Oh, thank you, and thanks to everyone for joining this webinar. Um, again, I'm Dr. Mahoum Solomon, the Assistant Director for Survey and Mapping at the Liberia Land Authority. Uh, the question about how the AU legal framework has inspired Liberia. Yes, I can speak to that, but I will not look at information from a general perspective, but I will try to narrow it down to the land sector for which I have um, my engagement. So as you may be aware, like was stated previously, Liberia assigned the Freedom of Information Act on September 16, 2010, and we have been implementing that. And basically that has provides um, all persons have the right to access to public information. So we at the Liberal Land Authority, an institution which was newly birthed um, 2016, and we our Land Rights Act was developed in 2018, and then now we are implementing um, with the little support from the government and our institutional partners. We have been trying our best to see how we can make available land information for public consumption. As you all may be aware, land is the post main investment, so it should be adequately managed. Um, we, we, at the moment, we are um, with support from our Swedish partner, 
we are developing a system that has been started from a modular basis. That is, we taking our land-based information, we have been paper-based to a digital environment. We own the fact that we want this in, a, in the coming year, we want to be able to showcase the information in the country where any land owner can be able to see um, available information so that you, before going into transaction, this way we will be able to solve crisis before even they get started. And the reason for this is simple. My country is just from um, 13 years civil war. And one of the main reasons for that was the, the kind of ugly land system we have. So we see this to be a paramount concern that we should be able to have our land information readily available to the public. So there should be transparency in any uh, uh, transaction. This will be able to bring some sanity to the land sector. So of course, yes, the, the AU legal framework um, inspired Liberia to come up with our own FOI, the Freedom of Information Act, and owing to the fact that we have that in the back of our mind, we want to be able to bring our land information so that each and every person in Liberia can have access to it and to avoid issue of any conflict, land conflict in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahum Solomon. Is is very, of course, we are very pleased to hear on the strong commitment towards access to information and transparency from the government of Liberia. Um, Say, Dima, I wanted to ask the same question to you um, and ask you to provide um, some. Uh, to zoom us uh, into West Africa and Senegal in particular, how this African Union ambitious legal framework influence uh, access to information in Senegal? What has Senegal done to make information, especially land information, of course, land data, more accessible to people? Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I'm happy to, to join this discussion about access to information in, uh, in Africa and to share the, uh, the experience of my country, Senegal. So the analysis of uh, Senegalese uh, context has revealed many challenges that can be summarized in, in three points. First of all, the majority of citizens do not have access to information in general and to land information in, in particular. Uh, from a legal perspective, the absence of uh, an access to information law is one of the difficulties shared by the various players involved. The use of budgetary information and financial information, the statue of whistleblowers, the mechanisms by which citizens and groups of citizens should be informed are all subject of in intense debates in Senegal. Uh, a process is underway to adopt an access to information law under the leadership of the Directorate of Good Governance, supported by technical partners such as the USAID and GIZ. Uh, technical drafting committee have been contributed to the adoption of uh, a draft law on access to information, but uh, this is where the process has uh, stopped. There is no access to information law in Senegal now. Uh, however, in practice, uh, the difficulties um, linked to access to information can be related at several, several levels. Firstly, it must be uh, known that since 2012, Senegal has adopted a, court, a transparency court in the management of public finance as part of the reforms initiated within the YMO, so West African Economic and Monetary Union. This court uh, stipulates that governments must in particular make budget information av available to citizens in a simple manner. There, there are not enough suitable formats and national languages are not used and the main information channels that it, it is internet, even though all the country is not covered. So this is the challenge that many citizens are, are, um, citizens are facing now. 
And the second point of my speech is citizens' participation in this decision-making process, which is very limited. Uh, in legal terms, citizens are not involved in the decision-making process at the national level. The only time where they can really participate during is during the budget orientation debate. But even then, they, they cannot take the floor. They are just observers. In this respect, the open government partnership is an excellent opportunity to strengthen collaboration between the states and civil society organizations. Many initiatives have been carried out since countries like Senegal joined the OGP in 2018, but in concrete terms, uh, considerable efforts still need to be made, mainly in land management. In practice, the progress toward open government encourages the states, in addition to collecting parliamentary opinions on the budget or on land, on land to go further by directly questioning citizens on the difficulties they are exper experiencing in a, in a region, a, com a community, etc. So the reality is that Senegal is not yet at, at this stage. Although some ministries are developing their programs with stakeholders in many sectors, more need to be done to ensure that the voices of the people living in the most marginalized areas are heard so that they prior, their priority needs are identified and, uh, and um, taken into account in public policies. And finally, Land management is the neglected aspect of these initiatives. In the absence of a legal framework on access to information, it is impossible for citizens to obtain the necessary data under the best possible conditions. Today, the legal framework is not favorable and reforms on the way do not take into account the issues of access to information. Uh, especially in the land area. That's why I sincerely hope that by joining our collective efforts, we will be able to make an, eff an effective advocacy with our government. Thank you so much. And I'm ready if you have some questions. Thank you, Seydima. This yeah. is Thank you so much for your contribution and to highlight the many challenges that still uh, remain, uh, especially when it comes to participation. Um, in the public space and how important information access to information is in that context. Um, I wanted to um, ask a question to Ken uh, from the uh, regional center of um, management of resources now. Um, as, a, as a lead um, data and technology uh, organization, um, that is uh, operating at the continental level and providing uh, support to um, to governments and other stakeholders uh, in Africa on um, act on land land data in particular. Um, can um, RCR um, RCMRD has been working you know, at the continental level to uh, support uh, um, and advance the agenda on access to information in Africa. Um, what uh, what has been doing? I mean, what are the most important program activities? Uh, can you uh, talk about, for instance, the the data hubs that uh, that you have developed? Um, how how the work was done? No, and and how did you organize yourself? No, who did you um, who do you work with? And, and um, yeah, just just can you talk about a little bit about your work? Okay, thank, thank you, Laura, and uh, colleagues from where you're joining from. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening as well. Uh, my name is Kenneth Casera. Uh, thank you, Laura, for introducing us earlier on. Uh, I work with the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, most commonly known as ASIMAD. And as the user engagement lead, and basically my role is to connect the user, the technology. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks, colleagues, for joining today's webinar as well. As, as a center of excellence, uh, We've supported the development of uh, open data hubs 
Uh, also training on digital data transformation, collection, processing, and uh, management and data portals as well. So we've done this in for various countries and uh, uh, some are in, at the continental level, uh, some at uh, the regional level, but with the aim of making information accessible to various user categories. So we've worked with uh, GIZ, the Africa Land Policy Center, GCI, uh, and the, the German firm that we helped build the Nelga platform together, the Nelga Secretariat. Uh, so we did come up with the Nelga Data Hub that makes data available for universities for research. So it's on, and uh, the unique bit of this data hub is that it enables also others to produce data and also be part and parcel of data producers and have that capacity to upload the various information that we have. So the unique side of this uh, data hub as well that it accepts both spatial and unspatial data. So uh, for some of us who have uh, publications, for some of us with articles, documents, this particular data hub enables us to be able to hold, put the data in that place. Uh, the aim of this is to make data available for universities to be able to use. So both in Africa and beyond, and we welcome people to check on that as well. Uh, we've also done uh, the AUDA NEPAD on, uh, with the, an on-land data help desk. So we've done this for four countries in Africa, where we're looking at bringing land data in one place. So we did that for Ghana, uh, for uh, Senegal as well. We've done that for Botswana and Namibia. And we hope with the support of the uh, AUDA NEPAD, we'll be able to continue and also handle the rest of the countries. Uh, sorry to mention that uh, we've done for Uganda as well. I was forgetting Uganda. They were part and parcel of the land data help desk. Uh, with the World Bank, we are working on a Malawi land information system. So through the Ministry of Lands in Malawi, we've uh, come uh, together to establish a land information system for the country to enable data access and uh, mostly data in terms of cadastra and land administrative aspects of that data as well. Uh, with the European Union through uh, GRC, we've done the Bioparma Regional Resource Hub that contains all the data that relates to biodiversity. So protected data management is also critical because land data also, it's also form part and parcel of the land information and the data that can help in decision making. Uh, with the C4, uh, we've also done uh, OFESA that is putting in place an observatory that can help uh, to gain, uh, that can help people to gain access to forestry data. So for Mozambique, uh, Botswana, Uganda, Kenya, with uh, Tanzania as well, we put in place an observatory through and with assistance from C4 to help uh, us do that. Also with the African Union Commission, we are working on a GMS and Africa, that is the global monitoring of environment and security and Africa that focuses on uh, wetlands, land degradation, and also on uh, uh, bringing those two elements together in a platform that enables us to share the services and the products that feeds into those uh, three particular thematic areas. Uh, with the UN Habitat, we've done an approach that is most commonly used nowadays in the land administration, and that is the fit for purpose approaches. Uh, so we uh, encourage participatory approaches and they bring on board communities to be able to uh, develop land data. And uh, this was done together with the uh, UN Habitat. Uh, important activities that uh, we do in regard to all those projects that I mentioned is that we need to start and we are already doing something referred to as data inventory. So what this basically means is that uh, we want to make data discoverable. And one way of doing that is to be able to know what each institution has and uh, the procedure for getting this data. And uh, if we are able to tell where the data is and how we can get it, then it will be easy for us to get the access. So aspect of data discovery is a critical component of what we do in, in, in all those that we are mentioning. Uh, and we'll also go, go into as far as putting in place an international conference that enables us to bring in on various players and uh, possibly how do we link science policy and uh, specifically land policy and the data aspects as well is a critical component of this website. And so we welcome all the institutions that are want to participate in this conference in August, be able to also link back to us and be able to share. Uh, so the activity, most of the times are based on uh, the linkage to these countries is through the Ministry of Lands, the Ministry of Environment, and uh, times even the Ministry of Energy that feels it's important for us to be able to put in place 
uh, uh, data hubs that support the information access initiative. And over to you, Laura, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for this uh, very interesting overview of uh, all the work that your institution is, is doing. And let me, let, me, um, let me take a question and address a question specifically to you, um, Ken, that has, uh, um, was posted by Leonardo Rondo. Um, as a, uh, I wanted to ask this question to you because you are an expert on, on user engagement and Leonardo uh, rightly pointed out that besides uh, access to land data for the public consumption is very important to put the, 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 the focus also uh, on, um, on use, no? on, on, on the use of, of data for uh, decision support um, and policy making. So, um, and this also, of course, comes with different challenges, no? such as data integration or, um, or visualizations no? or packaging, et cetera. Um, wanted to ask you, Ken, what RCMRD does no? to make data more usable, uh, easier to consume by people or you know, um, ready for decision making? Thank you, th thank you, Laura. Uh, it's it's it, it, it's a loaded question, and thank you uh, 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 for that question as well. Uh, so, what the center does is, uh, first of all, we train and build the capacity of institutions in data transformation. What we've discovered in various member states, not only in the eastern and southern Africa part of Africa, but the Africa as a whole, is that most of the information that we have are in hard copy. I mean, in maps. So. And that they are kept somewhere. Those are maps that were done several years ago, and they were kept somewhere. This data was uh, uh, kept somewhere, and most of the information about this to land is most of the time in hard copy. So, as MID is in the forefront of uh, digitizing this data, uh, so we build the capacity in terms of uh, data, digital data transformation. So, how do we make them in soft? Because if they're in soft copy, then it's easier for us to be able to share. And uh, with various formats already in place, we are able to bring it down to every user category. So we are able to tell and, uh, and bring it down to a level of uh, what, 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 what should a farmer expect from land data? What should a policymaker, because all of us at one point in time, we make decisions, but how do we want the information to look like? And that is why we do analyze something referred to as the information flow. So what, and uh, what's the, the, the channel, the instrument, that should be put in place for this data to be accessible. The data that we have, I'm sure that each of us we receive data daily. Best can the format that we receive this information and even the instruments, the channels, the platforms, how are they usable? And that is why we brought on board the usability aspect. And so various users are participate in the, uh, in, in the entire process as well as they're able to be able to use the final product. So user participation and engagement is something critical for the center as we move along with the aspect of training with digital data transformation and also look at the policies. Yeah, the, if, if the, the, the entire continent is step and our first level is putting in place uh, system that uh, enables to be able to redo the call policy. Because the city in Africa and each and every country categorized data to various levels based on sensitivity. Uh, it's purely to uh, some policies within the continent. And I uh, think we are grateful for the African Union for having this initiative that enables us to have a, a base in sharing data. So we train on digital data transformation. We train on formatting, we train on uh, entire data processing, and possibly they can be fed into the daily activities of each one of us in the various institutions. Over to you, Lyra. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you for responding to the questions. And let me invite everyone to pose more questions using the Q&A button at the, um, on your screen. Please put questions on for our panelists and I will uh, um, address the questions. Um, let me now turn to uh, Nani, and the question for you, Nani, is, um, so could you tell us more about um, 
strengthening advisory capacities for land governance in Africa, the SLGA, and also uh, the network of excellence on land governance in Africa, the program you're leading, uh, which is a network of uh, academic uh, institutions and experts. So how um, this program and this network has been supporting uh, African Union member states in building data capacity and improving access to information, uh, Nani? Thank you very much, Laura, and hello to everybody joining today's webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you already mentioned it, the Strengthening Advisory Capacities for Land Governance in Africa project is a GIZ project. It's funded by the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development with Germany. And um, we are very happy to have partnered with the African Union Commission and then more particularly also with the African, African Land Policy Center, the ALPC. Um, and together with them and also the World Bank, we are very proud to have co-created the Network of Excellence on Land Governance in Africa, NELGA, the network that you have already mentioned, which is a network of, at the moment, more than 70 academic institutions across actually 40 African states. And that being said, with this broad range of membership across the continent, of course, one of the objectives of NELGA is to support the AU member states in building the institutional capacity, in building the knowledge, building the human capacity, and also, of course, providing the data on everything related to land policies so that land policies can be developed in a sustainable manner, that they can be implemented accordingly, and of course, also from um, a monitoring point of view to see whether or not they are proving to be effective in the way that they should be. So how do we do that? The NAGA members, the academic institutions that we work with, that we support, they conduct applied research, mostly, of course, to the imminent policy questions that we've seen. Um, I mean, some of the other speakers have already outlined some of them. So, of course, one of the main areas is applied research, but beyond that, if we say we want to build capacities, we're also looking at providing trailer, tailor-made trainings. So if there is a particular ministry with a particular question and tier, I think it's very important to also look at data to say, okay, which kind of training needs do we need to access the data to actually then also use the data in a specific manner. So this is one of the ways that the NAGA partner institutions that we're working with is supporting the different member states in the different countries. And by doing so, I mean, you have outlined it, we have the agenda 2063 that we're contributing to, but most importantly, also the AU agenda on land. So just to give you one specific example, we have, or the African Union has developed guidelines on curricula for land governance. And these, of course, are the ones that then also underline the importance of data. So when we support curricular development, we also do it in line with looking at, okay, are the curricula also touching upon this important issue of data availability and data processing? So I think that is, also the main objective, of course, of our support as GIZ, as, a, as the German Development Corporation, to say, okay, what does it actually take to make evidence-based decisions on land issues? And here we see that land data is at the heart of it. So on all the issues, be it related to land policy development, be it related to land administration, land investments, land and agriculture, or land disputes, as also mentioned by Dr. Solomon before, we want sound decisions to actually be based on the right information, meaning the right data that needs to be there. And this is, of course, the angle that our project is supporting when supporting the NELGA network. Thank you. Indeed, thank you. Thank you so much, Nelsa, for these useful contributions. Very, very important that information is comes to the hand of those that need to make the right decisions. So thank you for, for that contribution. Um, let's move to the second part of this webinar. We've seen um, a very ambitious uh, legal framework uh, in place and implemented at different level and capacity in different geographical realities. We've seen uh, important networks, important um, tech and data um, uh, organizations now doing very important work across the continent in improving access to information, making it usable supporting government. Let's look uh, back you know, at the recent uh, the work that has been done um, and the major challenges uh, that are still there and, and but at the same time the main, the main lessons that we learn um, from the past. I wanted to come back um, to you uh, Dr. Uh, Mahoun Solomon and uh, looking at Liberia. 
and Liberia also signed up the Open Government Partnership, um, and the, and is very committed uh, to it. You now, in the current three years action plan, you no know, has concrete commitments on open uh, information, and in, as well as improving transparency in the land authority in particular. Um, and also, there is a, you know, an, a, an approved um, access to information act. So, in your um, can you just share with the audience what has been your experience in engaging with such a platform? Um, what have you have you been learning? Um, and what did and didn't work? Do you think is an is an important mechanism to increase access to information for the sector, for the land sector in particular? Okay, uh, thank you, Laura, for that question. Um... Um, from our end of, um, the, from the government of Liberia, particularly the Liberia Land Authority, we will say um, the Open Government Partnership is a, is a good tool that could be used, that, that is being used to showcase our land information. And I will try to contextualize that. And what we've done of late, um, with support from the World Bank and, and the Swedish government, Start, firstly, I will start with the World Bank. We were able to conduct series of awareness so that people in our rural parts can have access to land information, can know about their rights to land because that's given them some level of security. So, and as you may be aware, my country, Liberia, has um, a high illiteracy rate. So, um, and access to internet is kind of um, limited. So we try to use traditional means. We were able to put out people in the field to go and do awareness, carry on awareness in our rural part of the country, going to the fact that we have the knowledge of the open government partnership involvement. So our people went in the field, carry out awareness, massive awareness within the 15 political subdivision of our country. Even though that was not a total success because still information did not reach to the depth of um, the entire country because of bar rules and other factors, but at least to a considerable standpoint, we're able to be able to ensure that our local people are aware of the land rights act and the land authority and their right to land ownership. So coming back, um, so uh, uh, our Swedish counterpart also helped us because like I stated, um, my country Liberia has 30% land in urban area and the rest is in customary area. So um, um, with our knowledge of that, we decided that um, we should be able to formalize the land, giving ownership to our people. And how do we do that? The land authority as a regulatory institution cannot do that on our own. So we have CSOs working in these various communities trying to formalize land. And when I say formalize the land, try to bring ownership to them so they can be able to use it for transactional purposes. So now, and when they do this formalization, all the information is managed through a portal. We have been able to develop a portal with the support from our Swedish counterpart. Um, the CSO enter data to that portal, and then other CSO can see that to avoid overlap so that different people cannot work in the same area and of course pretty much confusion. So we developed this portal from um, the, the support from the Swedish government and now CSOs and other land actors are using it and working in the field, trying to ensure that our people have um, the ownership to land. Uh, in such, what didn't what did what didn't work? Um, it has been some challenges, you know. Um, since the land authority came to being, it has been only one government. But we know that um, financial constraint is one. We want to be able to have all our um, um, com our communities in Liberia formalized so that we can have that information transmitted um, to cent a centralized location. And this issue of a leadership turnover, we are approaching election, we know in the African context, once there's a change of government, you have most, most of the technical people or um, a head of institution be changed, new people will come in and that, that can lead to some drawback in implementing um, some uh, policy and issue. Thank you. 
Um, thank you so much, Dr. Um, Solomon. Um, let me let me ask another question, if I may, which uh, comes from uh, one of our um, attendees, Alexander Gomez, uh, who is rightly asking because you mentioned customary, uh, a lot of customary, um, a lot of land in Liberia is still under customary regulations, and how do you imagine your relationship of you know, formalizing? Um, uh, customary rights and, and also um, providing indigenous groups access to uh, their data and their information. How do you manage the relationship between opening, you know, improving access to information to people in a context where a lot of land is not really formalized? Is this a, a threat for these communities? How do you defend and protect their rights uh, to access information? Thank you. So the first thing is we have um, the land rights act that was um, passed into law in 2018, and that provides that each individual in the law Liberian should have ownership to land. So given the fact that um, it's customary, we have an obligation as an authority to be able to formalize the land across in most of our rural part. But the sad thing is resources are limited as scarce. So we rely heavily on partners um, working in the land space to be able to formalize. And then now we as a government institution, we have been able to come up with set procedures on how we can formalize this land. I mean, take them from their customary setting to, um, to deeding, giving them the um, statutory deed for this land. The project involves six basic steps that start with um, community self-identification and we can identify the land. We come up with bylaws, we do boundary work, we do confirmatory survey, we do um, land use planning, we develop participatory land use planning, and then subsequently issue the deed to this community. And once they have the deed, then we ensure that they have they have some their right to the land is protected, and that land cannot be sold until after 50 years because we avoid the issue of, of, of land grabbing. And then now for the issue of managing this data, we have developed a portal that is, that is currently running. All our CSO that are working in the community upload that data to our platform. And then it is publicly available free. But um, for the CSO that are entering the data, they have some uh, restriction. You don't just enter the data and it's available. We carry on, the data is subjected to data review process, which is done at the land authority. And here in the process of formalization, what we do is that we have a stage where we do awareness again. We tell them the, what this process is all about, why you stand to benefit and your commitment, what we expect of you in this process as a customary community. So that, that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Solomon. Sedima, let me come back to you. You just uh, you already mentioned um, how Senegal has uh, signed up to the Open Government Partnership and, and the experience. Could you perhaps elaborate a little bit more on, or may, maybe provide co some concrete examples on specific commitments that has been followed on and, and the benefits of engaging with such a platform? Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. I think that there are a lot of benefits of uh, joining such a platform. Uh, uh, for example, for a country to join the Open Government Partnership, the collaboration between the, the government and civil society organizations is non-negotiable. So since 2018, uh, the government, the Senegalese government and some civil society organizations have developed a national action plan. Uh, and one of the, the priorities was to adopt an access to information law. So this gave um, an example of collaboration or an opportunity of co collaboration between the, the stakeholders. And uh, more, I, I personally had the opportunity to participate in uh, several P2P learning events, uh, mainly in Cote d'Ivoire and in, in Kenya. Uh, and uh, this was an opportunity to share um, and to learn from each other uh within within the continent so i i do think that this is a good platform uh, that can be used uh, to uh, to improve access to information as well as citizens participation in the budgetary process and also accountability but uh, the thing is uh, uh when uh, we are developing such a, such an initiative generally we don't take into account the political context 
And uh, for example, in Senegal, we will organize a, a presidential election next year. And um, um, regarding the person who will be in charge of the country the five the next five years, uh, you, you, we are we are not sure if whether or not this law will be adopted. Uh, and this is why, um, while developing such an initiative, it is important to take into account the political context, uh, because this can 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 um, can you know uh, um, uh, it, this can uh, can be a, an, an, um, a difficulty that we we won't able to 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 to, uh, to address. Uh, but to my opinion, it's, it it is really a good uh, initiative, but. Uh, let's just take more into account the political context and to involve uh, other stakeholders like the parliamentary and local governments. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you, Sadima. Yes, indeed, it requires um, uh, a widespread commitment and engaging in engagement to really if at, at all level of uh, in the of the government to really as the major custodian of land data to really improve um, uh, access to information and make any important change. Let me go back to Ken um, and uh, talking about challenges and lessons learned from the past years. Um, Ken, what have been your major lessons learned uh, from the initiatives that RCR and have uh, uh, implemented over the last 10 years in relation to uh, adoption, readiness, or deployment of the technology. I see, for instance, in the chat, there are you, uh, uh, an, an, an attendee that is asking why, whether you are working in Mozambique or in Kenya, or whether you provide um, land um youth data etc so there are many still many requests for um rc rmd to to engage but still i i imagine that you have already a, a good understanding of what the, uh, what you've been able to achieve and and what are the major challenges still ahead and your main lessons learned thank you thank you laura and uh Thank for the question as well. Uh, so for, for the center, before I come to the challenges, let me uh, mention that we work in Eastern and Southern Africa and uh, Mozambique is part and parcel of uh, that, that, that scope. And not only in Eastern Southern Africa, but we work in entire Africa. So we, are, uh, we have the mandate to be able to support each and every institution in Africa, both private and public individuals as well, to be able to gain access to earth observation information. So we are, we are not only in Kenya, but uh, various member states as well, and beyond the member states. So we are willing to always uh, step in to support in various ways that are, are deemed necessary for us. So uh, now as well, let, let me now handle the, the aspect of the challenges and allow me to categorize them into four. Uh, the, the, the challenges in technology, the challenges in the usability of the information therein, the challenges in aggression, and also challenges in uh, the framework, the policies as well. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we've learned in the last 10 years this, that data is a critical component of any information system. And uh, since we're dealing with information access, we, we want to be able to do away with the systems. So later, and the data itself has to be somewhere. Uh, and, and most of the time, uh, we find those data in hard copies. That's why it's easy to get them on the chart. So the dangers will exist in and there is some problems with the, with your audio. Maybe you should turn out the video and maybe the audio will improve. Can you hear? Go ahead, please. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. That, thank you for that interrupt. Apologies. Uh, so that uh, a lot of uh, that, and data that exist in Africa is in hard copy and that it has to uh, to have them in software. And also, the aspect of data collection, I can well that uh, most data in Africa is uh, categorized either sensitive 
for public consumption or private. Therefore, we assist the granting access to this data uh, because we in the sensitive and once we get the level where we define data sensitive, then already we have a barrier to sharing that data. Uh, so we need a aspect of classification and categorization of what is public and what is private, and how we make the sensitive data still accessible, but in a way that can protect the owner of the data as well. Uh, so one of the things that we've learned as well is the automation of the processes. So in terms of processing data, how do we make these processes from the data processing to the data access and the data is not dynamic, it changes. So how do we put in systems that can automate this uh, so that we are able to, each, each and every time there's a thing, it easily fits the existing data that we, we had already. So automation is critical and we are in the forefront of assisting countries to automation. And lastly, on data standards, and I think the Open Geospatial Consortium has put in place uh, various data standards to support in the spatial data, but uh, rarely do find standards, st st standards that support the non-spatial data. So what criteria do we use to make sure that a document, an article, uh, publication is something that, 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 that possibly you can speak with authority over? And so we still lack the aspect of authenticating the spatial data that exists in the, in, in the countries. So for the spatial data, we look for this because they put in place the data and the quality assurance that come along with that as well. But what do we say about non-spatial data? We have data on documents, we have data on articles, we have data published and publications from various academic institutions as well as private and public government institutions. But how do we how do we categorize this? Do we have a criteria that looks at the credibility of this data as, as, as much as we have the criteria on the on the spatial side of over to you, Laura. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for mentioning these four important challenges, uh, which uh, we really, really um, share with you as, as a data um, organization. So the importance of standards, the importance of uh, automation, the importance of uh, an aggregation, and uh, and also yes, privacy. No privacy and and uh, and 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 data equity and data justice. No, because opening up data cannot come without the recognition that um, privacy is, is also a value, and and uh, and there is some vulnerability uh, attached to data. So it must be very it must be taken into account very carefully. Nanny, I wanted to also give you the floor now and ask uh, what have been the challenges and lessons uh, learned for the NALGA network in advancing this agenda on access to information in Africa. Yeah, thank you very much, Laura. And I think I sort of have to jump on of what of those previous speakers have already mentioned, right, with the challenges that we have also been facing. Of course, we're looking at it from an academic point of view and also from our partner institutions, the academic institutions across the continent. And there, of course, we see that there is a great interest in, on the one hand, having data available, not only for specific research projects, but also then to specifically look at um, conducting research, be it, for example, on the accessibility of land data in a given country. And um, we do witness that there are still numerous gaps when it comes to the availability of that kind of information. And as Ken was saying, of course, especially if we look at more sensitive data, geospatial data that might have certain ramifications when being published. So um, we try to look at it on the one hand to say, OK, let's look at the principle of subsidiarity. What can we do also on a regional level? Do, for example, the nodes that we work with, these are the regional hubs that we are partnering with. Can they start on a regional level with collecting the necessary data? And here, for example, we have, for example, the host institution of the Nelga North Africa node, the Institut Agronomique et Veterinaire Hassan II, the IAV in Rabat, Morocco, where they say, okay, we put a strong focus on geospatial data and we try to put a regional re repository to avail that data, but here, of course, on the regional level. Um, our project, of course, working with the African Union, the idea is to also have all of that available on a continental level. And we've talked about the guidelines that already exist from the African Union Commission. 
And um, seeing that Ken is here, he knows about it. We have embarked on a partnership already with RCMRD to say, okay, how can we support, in this case, together also with Auda NEPAD, um, see how can we support member states create so-called land data help desks in selected countries. And I mean, what we did witness there as well, of course, we there's a possibility to provide necessary training on software, hardware, and so forth, to then also make the necessary information available. We do see that there needs to be a very strong commitment when it comes to mandate and resources provided to the institutions um, that are responsible for data. And here, of course, we also have the issue that it's oftentimes not only one institution, right? There needs to be this whole of government approach to say, okay, what do we actually provide, which kind of information? And here I would add to the challenges that were already outlined, I would add this aspect of mandate and resources that we then, of course, always witness because, of course, from a, from a development point of view, we want to make sure that it's sustainable. So the mandate has to be there in the national governments and also the resources have to be there to continue the work that we can only kickstart. Thank you. You highlighted a very, very critical point on the mandate. Who is who are the custodians of land that who has the mandate to really curate and make data available to, to people? And what kind of support can all the uh, the, the sector provide um, to the custodians? Tommy, um we heard about many challenges and and that, that different initiatives uh, had and, and efforts being done you know, to provide a, an enabling environment for opening up land data and improve access to information. Could you briefly share with us whether the picture that Ken or, um, or Nani, uh, Saidina or Dr. Mahoud have uh, uh, picture as uh, is is coming is coming up you no know, in the in the state of land uh, information research. Do you recognize some of these challenges in your research? Hi, thank you, Laura. I I definitely think that there is a lot of resonance with what some of the previous speakers have said in terms of what we have found so far, and and I just want. One of the uh, questions, I think it was a question that you asked to Ken, that came from one of the uh, participants that said, you know, what do we do with data that we want government to adopt in decision making? And I wanted to just stress here that from the land portals perspective, we have taken that approach um, that data and, and in our work, we look at data that is produced by government for its use and how effective government is in that regard, because there are lots of um, data portals by the World Bank and other international organizations that have data on land. But our assessment focuses really more on the role of government as one of the primary custodians. So when we start looking at data at a national level, and I, I'm gonna group this into three key takeaways. The first one, and Ken also alluded to, to some of that, the first one is that typically we find that more data exists at the national level than is initially anticipated. So often we hear that people and countries will say there is no land data in country X. When we do that, we find that it's not completely true. There is data, but often it is not accessible. Or, or, or very accessible, it is not so available. Sometimes it's not digital, sometimes it's on closed systems, but there is already a strong foundation or opportunity in that challenge as well. I think the second key point that we've come across is that having said that there's data available, the data sources are fragmented, they are unstructured, um, they are not interoperable, they are poorly documented and thus not open, even if they are often considered public data. So we will often hear the comment that, but we make our data available, we uploaded it on the website. But when you look at the data, it is difficult to discover, it cannot be found, um, and it doesn't use common standards. It, it doesn't use interoperable standards, which I think is critical for making the data discoverable and for making the data interoperable. And I think this is a key area um, of work that needs to be done. And I think the, 
The third key area um, that we've identified is that there is a significant data community and data capacity in many of the countries that we have looked at. That data capacity might not always be in the land sector. Um, I think uh, our speaker from Senegal mentioned the importance of the open budget and, and a lot of that data has been published in open formats, but less of it is finding its way to the land sector. So it's about identifying that capacity and marrying it with the land sector. In terms of the specific findings for land data, and here I'm talking about data on the tenure use development and value of land, we have found that legal and policy data, so your acts, your statutory documents are often quite open and available, as well as what we call other land data. This may include data on agricultural or national census data, even uh, things such as public procurement or beneficial land ownership, and sometimes on, on land reforms. So this is where the most open data in the land sector resides. On the core functions of tenure and value, we find almost zero open data available. There's a little bit more land use data available, but also not very much land development data. This is data on development uh, applications, development licenses, whether it's urban and rural, and how those um, processes are tracked and enforced. So we find that data on the core functions of land administration is actually quite scarce. And then the last point I want to make is that of the 11 countries where we've now done um, research, we find that South Africa, which was the first country to implement an open ATI law, um, has the most open data ecosystem. But surprisingly, Namibia and Zambia come in next. And Namibia only passed an ATI law at the end of last year, and Zambia does not have an ATI law yet. But what they have managed to do was actually to create open data portals, to start having a conversation about spatial data infrastructures, about standards, in the, even in the absence of a law. And I think this area of standards, of interoperability, and providing some technical proficiency with the data, and I think Ken also mentioned that, is really the key areas of improvement and performance that are available. But I think this demonstrates the importance also of developing a benchmark, a global benchmark that we can measure and map these results and really have a mechanism to understand how countries are performing with regards to opening up and making data available. Indeed, indeed. And this, this uh, let us move to the, to the following uh, session of this webinar, which is exactly about uh, benchmarking uh, access to land information. And you, um, the research work done by the land portal um, Ray, uh, highlights how important it is to um, document uh, the state um, also um, can mention no, the, the importance of uh, having, uh, um, how do you call it, the repositories, no, um, um, catalogs that, that describe you know, who uh, has, who holds what information, what is the state of this information. Um, but then it's also important to have a global overview, you know, a rating of you know, how this information uh, performs vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, international recognized open data standards. And that's the old, um, the old vision of um, having such a benchmarking tool. So Tommy, can, can, um, can you explain um, what, what you are proposing uh, you know, as, as a benchmarking for open land data? Thank you. I think what we are proposing, and I want to touch on, on the first two points, um, is that we need a, a, a benchmark on land information. And I think one of the uh, participants also asked that question, what is land information? So we need a benchmark that defines land information and that defines openness or access uh, to data. 
And so what we are proposing really is to refine the work that we've already done uh, in the SOLI methodology and on the land module with a global data barometer in order to develop a globally comparable index for the state of land information uh, across the world. And, and such a new indicator from the land portal aims to make land related findings more actionable and to complement existing land governance monitoring initiatives. So it assesses the openness of land data at the country level and at the global level. Why do we think this is needed? We think that land data in the public domain enables the efficient use of land. It also assists with ensuring transparency and improves decision-making and service provision. The, the data is not the goal in and of itself. It is really what governments can improve with regards to delivery of services. We think it can be used by data custodians, by policy makers, very important, and also by researchers, land development practitioners, and, and other open data and data advocates. I think it is based on our existing methodology. And what it does is to take the, the modern theory of land administration and use that as a basis for defining what land data is, and also to use that land administration theory for sustainable development to identify the core land data categories so that the data can actually support land governance. And then it also ensures that the indicator is aligned with FELA, the Framework for Effective Land Administration, and the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. And Ken mentioned sort of standards and interoperable. So I think it is important that an index is aligned with these continental and global instruments to ensure uh, interoperability. And we can then assess the openness across these categories and have various ways that participants can investigate the data so that the findings can be used not only to describe the degree of openness, or to describe an organization's capabilities with regards to opening data, but can be used as a diagnostic to identify obstacles for opening up land data and making it more accessible so that the findings can be implemented to improve the situation we find ourselves in. Thank you, Tommy. Um, Thank you. I Thank you so much for um, presenting all this important work. And there are many questions. Um, I'm also trying to respond and address these questions uh, on uh, between your interventions. But there are many, many coming, which is great. And uh, thank you for posing all these questions. Um, I wanted to come back to uh, Seydina now, and while I ask you what you think about you know, the importance of this assessment, uh, um, I, I also want to take advantage of uh, this question to address the question from Mamadou, who um, specifically for Senegal, who, who says, one thing is access to information and you know, measuring, assessing access to information and data. But another thing is verifying the authenticity you know, of this information, the compliance you know, with uh, certain standards. So he says that the main problem in Africa might be that, and in Senegal in particular, that is there is a lot of information um, available does not reflect the reality on the grounds. Um, and this might have, um, of course, um, uh, my influence, no? how policies are then uh, formulated. So what do you think about this exercise of documenting and assessing information and how do you think we should address this, uh, the risk of you know, the available, publicly available information not um, um, not reflecting the reality of the ground. Yes, thank you so much, Laura, and thank you to Mamadou for this uh, important question. Uh, I think that he's, uh, he's right. Uh, one of the big challenges that we are facing is um, the quality of the, of the data that we can find, mainly at the local level. 
And that's why I think that the SOLI report can be used as an opportunity to run a data quality assessment, especially on the local level to see what are the kind of data that are available and uh, if um, these data have a good quality and can be used, uh, especially for advocacy purposes. Uh, and uh, I think that one of, one of the opportunity that we have now in Senegal is there is recently a reform uh, that um, allow uh, communities to have what we call collective rights. So for example, if there is a community, a community somewhere uh, who is living in this area for many years or for decades, they can now have a collective right, not an individual right, but a collective right uh, in, this, in this land. And this is an, an opportunity that can be used to, to, um, um, to, to target uh, the users of, of the land in Senegal. Uh, what are their... Uh, their what are their identity? Uh, is, the, is it a community or is it just one person, etc.? So I think that this is an, uh, an, an important question. And it is, the reality is that there are a lot of data uh, that can be found, especially in Senegal at different level. And this data can be different from one person to another or from one institution to another. And running a data quality assessment can be, to my opinion, a good solution so that we can, we can develop a strong data, uh, uh, land data in, uh, in Senegal. And uh, I, uh, what we are now trying to develop with land portal is to use the, the SOLI report in order to, to run a survey uh, in Senegal, especially in some region, in order to develop uh, this solution. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you, Sejina. Thank you for your yeah. question. Um, I wanted to um, now ask the same question to uh, Dr. Uh, Mahoum Solomon. Um, how important is to have such a measurement, such a documentation uh, to get a proper understanding um, of the state of land data, be able to respond to the challenges around land information? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, uh, it's, it's very much important to um, be able to um, showcase data by the same time um, be able to measure, to be able to tell what are people, what are um, the people from the local environment, the local setting, uh, have the right information at the right time. So, um, with that being said, so there are a lot of ways people, we from our country carry on that. Like I stated earlier, we have a um, very high illiteracy rate. So, we, we tend to use um, local engagement. That is people even use town crier to go and inform people about information. But um, there are some downside to that. You see that um, we'll not be able to get to every part of the country, one, because of in inaccessibility in some locations, you cannot reach there. And um, another issue is the lack of uh, reliable data. You, you see that sometimes the, the, the data is not all that good, but so you have to have extra layer of, of review. Then again, we come back to capacity building, capacity building the sense of um, the CSOs, our land actors are involved in, in, in land activities, be able to come up to speed, to be able to handle the, the technology. So we, we, we talk about having periodic or continuous capacity building for, for them. Then one thing I would like to stress on here is that in my country, we have most land institutions working in silos. We have the forestry, we have the EPA, we have the, um, the statistical house. They all deal with information, land information, geospatial information, so to speak, but they are working in silos. We don't have a common platform, with, uh, you know, owing to the fact of the, National Spatial Data Infrastructure, we don't have a common um, a repository where we have this thematic version of data. So, so for example, EPA, you need information on, on mangrove, wherever you can get it from there. We got the statistical um, population, you can get information on population. We got the forestry, we don't have that. All the inst institutions are working in silo. And then another thing, um, to be able to monitor 
the knowledge, people's not perception of, of the, the data or lay, online information that is very limited. Um, most of our activity are donor driven. And as you may be aware, donors have their priority and they have time bound. So after that time they leave, then the issue of sustainability becomes a problem. So you cannot go, be, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources to always go back to check, you know, as, as to how people are handling information, how people are managing that information. So um, another thing is apart from the FOR that I mentioned earlier, we don't have any law on data on standard and to be able to articulate our geospatial needs. So I think it's something we've been talking. We it's, it's a good thing to have national legislature involved to be able to come up with data or stand um, maybe even passing a law on data, data quality and standards and all that. Yeah, um, so far that's that's all I have for now. It is a very great um, contribution uh, to the debate. Um, so, Nanny, you want to share your opinion also on how important is it to document and measure um, and have a proper understanding of, uh, uh, of the state of land uh, information. Yes, thank you very much, Laura. And um, let me also congratulate you and your team, of course, for having already embarked on the SOLI reports, which provide a very good benchmarking, so to speak, of course, for in order to compare different countries. So thank you for that. I think, I mean, um, hearing the discussion, there are a few thoughts that came to my mind is, of course, um, as Tommy had mentioned, the question of the standards that are necessary for indexes, right? So which ones do you use? I know the African Union also has their own sort of MELA indicators for monitoring the evaluation of land in Africa. So this would be something to consider, of course, for the African continent. And then, of course, um, one thing that came to mind also is which type of information do we actually consider? I mean, we talked a lot about customary um, land rights and so forth. And then the question that actually popped to my mind was how do we actually ensure that also orally transmitted information is being considered? Because, of course, we have a very... I would almost say Western understanding in the say in the sense that you know information has to be written down, data has to be made available. But I'm now looking at how do we ensure that also non-written information can sort of be captured in in the assessment that we're doing. That is one thought, and then of course the the second thought that I had was. Um, I mean, we know that the benchmarking is not a one-off activity, right? So it has to be updated regular. And I think this is something that needs to be considered, of course, already when initiating such a process. Um, but in general, I mean, for our work, it's very much welcomed. Um, of course, we hope that also the benchmarking helps also then from a decision maker point of view, motivate the decision makers to keep up with the so-called standards to make sure that, of course, their level of benchmarking is being increased over time. So that would be my thoughts also with regards to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Len. Very, very interesting. And Ken, would you also um, like to share your point of view? Uh, you mentioned data catalogs and the work done on data catalogs. Um, so you recognize the importance of uh, documenting and assessing um, land data. Please share your view. Uh, th thank you, Lara. And uh, let me also echo Nani's uh, congratulations on the report. Uh, it's much welcome and we are hoping to see uh, much of it as well. Uh, just to pick from uh, possibly what Tommy was saying, and uh, I think I'm able to see the five points of entry for various users. And that's from the big picture all the way to the downloads. I think this will be a critical addition to uh, the already existing indicators. I think Nani has mentioned mail already. And so we welcome this much because many a times we don't even agree about the definition of some critical words in workshops. And uh, if we are able to agree about them at the global level, then it's easier for us to pull it down even to the country levels. So allow me to say that uh, this is much welcome and that it will go a long way in supporting our endeavor in uh, making land data accessible and available to the public. Thank you and over to you, Laura. Thank you. And Tommy, do you see any difference uh, between ranking and, and uh, rating? Now we are not, of course, uh, looking at comparing, uh, measuring uh, government or, or, or state performance here, but really to have a better understanding, not to have an entry point for discussion and uh, improvement. 
No, absolutely, Laura. And I think it's fundamentally important. While I recognize that, you know, an element of, of competition cannot be eliminated, um, but the, the goal is not to compare countries with one another for, for the sake of bragging rights, but rather to compare each country with the benchmark that they set for themselves. In other words, there's a benchmark for opening up data and there's criteria or categories of land data. And countries can use the index to benchmark themselves in terms of their achievements and set goals for themselves. I think rather than um, looking at what is country X, Y, or Z doing. So I think that's the value of an index like this uh, that is based on these kind of uh, benchmarking that allows countries to use it as a diagnostic for improvement and not only as, as a uh, sort of competitive tool to see who is better than who. I think you're on mute, Laura. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Just on the issue of documentation, there is a, a, an interesting comment uh, um, by um, Cholugo Salimata, yeah, for, perhaps for the land porter, but also for, for Ken. Um, he says that um, if any project exists at um, the conservation, you know, the documentation of the archival uh, documents, those that date back from the colonial period, you know, because these are major source of knowledge of African land and are generally in a very poor condition and of course not digitized. Um, so I don't know if uh, RCRMD is doing anything about this legacy uh, historical uh, data and information can, um, but of, of course uh, this would be very ambitious. Uh, to have such document digitized and available online, I guess. Maybe just very quickly to add, Laura, Senegal is the only country that I'm not the only country, but one of the countries that we worked off that has um, an archival law that uh, specifies that the archives must be open access. So I thought that's just an interesting point on that question because it's a very good point. Thank you. It's, thank you for reminding us that, Tommy. Ken, you want to add anything or respond to? Sure, 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 Laura. And, 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 and uh, I think that's uh, that's one that's a good question. And uh, if you walk to many of the of the, of the of the institutions in Africa that has data that relates to land or land data, uh, most of them are in hard copy because they are done long, long time ago, and so they're not willing to be able to do that. But I can also clearly mention that uh, it's within the mandate of the service. Uh, for, 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 for the case of Kenya, it's the survey of Kenya mandated to be able to look at some of these things with the Ministry of Lands. And uh, we are happy to mention that uh, we supported the survey of Kenya to digitize all the beginning with the topographical maps that they had in 1972 to date. So they were digitized just a normal scanning from hard copy to soft copy. And that make it easier for us to be able to even do the updating. It's easier to update a soft copy than a hard copy. Uh, so that is a critical bit of things. And uh, we've supported Ghana as well in that, as well as uh, Kenya. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and we are looking forward to, to doing so much more in that regard. Thank, Thank you, you and over to you. Thank you. And we got to an end of our webinar is already um, uh, 3 30, so we need to close. Uh, but let me wrap up by asking each of you to share uh, what is the one key um, land data challenge or wish you know, that, uh, uh, that uh, Africa must consider you not know, to uh, really um, become um, the powerhouse of the future. Um, let me start by Tommy first, and then each of you before we close. Hi, thank you, Laura. I, 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 this is going to be a little bit obvious, but I think um, the way forward for us really is to establish this need to measure and benchmark access to land data in order that we can understand how to improve the land data ecosystem. Thank you, thank you. And Nanny, what is your... 
your message? Yeah, my message, my wish would be um, to look at the mandates and then bring together the relevant institutions and make sure that each institution knows its mandate and making sure that the data can be provided because land is such a cross-cutting topic. Thank you so much, Nani. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Bahut, uh, what is the one challenge that you would like to be addressed or your wish for the future, for the way forward? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. I will use one word, collaboration. I want African country to be able to collaborate. It could be through knowledge sharing or whatever, so that we can see what this other country is doing, what I'm not doing when I'm, I'm falling short of some things and then I can tap into the knowledge from another country and adapt that and move forward. So the key word here is collaboration to take our learning information forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahoud. Let's break silos and collaborate. And Saidina, what is your takeaway, the, the, key, the key challenge or your wish for the future? Yeah, thank you so much. My wish is open data for better service delivery. Uh, in Senegal, we have a particularity. 90% of all the claims in our courts are related to land. So I, I, I wish that one day we will, uh, we will address this problem and we can use open data for, uh, for, to, to improve citizens' access to public services. Thank Info. you. Good, and a good wish. Ken. Oh, thank, thank you, Laura. I, I have two. I hope I'm, 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 it's okay. Fair enough. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I, uh, we should digitize the data. As, uh, as uh, people are mentioning here, colleagues as well, we, we have the data already, but we need to digitize that data. And that will be accessible. Then the second bit is that uh, uh, the, the mentality and the perception of uh, keeping data. I want to inform our colleagues here today that when you open data, people will enrich that data. They will not misuse it but they'll make it better. So if we want data to be made better and quality even in terms of the attribute that comes with it, then let's open the data. We'll enrich it uh, far, far than misusing it. Thank you and over to you, Ray. Thank you. This is a great statement to close this webinar. So big, big thank to our great uh, panelists. Thank you for your time and your engagement. It was really a rich conversation. We learned so much. Thank you for joining. Thank you for all the participants, a very big group of participants. We appreciate your participation until the very end. Please take the survey and, um, and uh, please share your, uh, provide your feedback on how we could improve it, do better. Thank you everyone. And uh, let's close the webinar, a big um, clap to all of you. And uh, we wish to see you uh, next time. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.